For everyone that's here in the room today and everyone that's in the in VC offices around London, thank you very much for coming to today's Authors at Series. My name is Christina Smith. I'd like to introduce you to three fine gentlemen. Well, two fine gentlemen and one guy I just met a few minutes ago, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, from the illustrious pub quiz team that I've been fortunate enough to know for the past few years, we've got Richard Moore, Daniel Freebie. They're going to walk you through. God, I feel like I'm doing like a client presentation right now. We're going to walk you through a few samples today. Um, we're going to talk, they're going to talk to you today about their, their best-selling books that have been out um, for a while, Slaying the Badger and... Oh, what is the Eddie Merck's cannibal? Cannibal. Something like that. Okay. And then also joining us today, if, if two is not enough, we're very, very fortunate as well to have Mr. Ned Bolting here. Ned's book, How I Won the Yellow Jumper, um, it's been out for probably three years uh, now. No, no, a few, ten months. Ten like months. Said it. God, it feels like it's been months, out longer. Yeah. You write for the, no, I, write for the Guardian, is that right? Uh, no, I broadcast for ITV. Oh, okay, close television, enough. But, yeah. I, I, you can tell I really, I'm just completely <laughs> reading it. Sorry, not the Guardian. That's probably wrong. Daily else. Mail. You, could no. just, you Google me. Yeah, just, I, just, I did. That's the very <laughs> thing. I should have just read what I wrote yeah. a couple of months ago. All right, with that embarrassing last comment, I'm going to shut up and just let these guys take it away. Uh, this is going to be a really fun hour, so I'm, I'm excited about what's going to happen. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Christina, for that wonderful introduction. Um, these are the, the three books you mentioned. Um, we were going to sort of basically talk maybe 10, 15 minutes about each one with the, Ten minutes. the author um, being quizzed on, on his book. Um, and we thought we'd start with, with Ned's uh, How I Won the Yellow Jumper, um, which is a, a kind of great introduction to the, the sport because it, it covers your, your own introduction to the sport. You were a highly uh, competent, experienced professional broadcaster who was parachuted into the... the Ted, is that you? <laughs> <laughs> um, you, were, you were parachuted into the... Uh, Tour de France in 2003, yep. and um, the title of the book comes from a pretty embarrassing encounter you had on the Champs Elysees after the first stage of Prague time trial. Can you tell us? I, I'll, in, in, in very brief summary, it was the first bike race I'd ever seen of any description. I'd never, you know, never ridden a bike, raced a bike, seen a bike race, and the foot. So my first introduction to it was that the prologue of the 2003 Tour de France, which cycling fans here will remember, turned out to be one of the most epic in modern times. Um, the prologue was in Paris, which is unusual in itself, so the setting was extremely grand. Not only that, to compound the importance of the occasion, but a British rider, David Miller, pre-doping ban, was actually uh, the hot favourite. But mid-doping. But mid-doping was, <laughs> was, for good reasons, the hot favourite to win that day. Um, and, uh, and, um, and so he should have done, actually, uh, had it not been for the fact that in the final bend onto the final home straight, his, his uh, chain bounced off his chain ring and uh, he lost uh, uh, time and just missed out. And anyway, this all sort of, we were broadcasting live on ITV1 actually then, but not on ITV4, so on the big network and, and you know, to a big audience. And um, all this chaos ensued where we thought we had this British winner and in the end he missed out by a fraction of a second, rode over the line, disappeared, uh, and we had to find out what had happened to him. And of course, we couldn't get an interview with David Miller. And it's one of those broadcasting situations where television is in desperate need for information to relay home, but more often than not, you haven't got it. So you start kind of making stuff up. And the director, without really warning me, just suddenly made the presenter, Gary Imlach, who'd run out of things to say because he'd used up all the scant information he had. He kind of threw across to me uh, to say uh, what I knew about the situation. And I was in a complete state of confusion. So I, the only thing that came out of my mouth was... I, David Miller's just blown his chances of winning the yellow jumper. Not realising that, of course, it's not a jumper, is it? It's a jersey, it's an iconic, uh, you know, sporting uh, trophy, and uh, I just made a bloody fool of myself. Um, I didn't realise I'd done that until much later when some people told me how much of a tit I'd made out of myself. But, um, so, but that was it. So that was, that's the kind of, in terms of that book, that's the starting point. That's the, that's the ignorance yeah, yeah. in which I could only yeah, accrue you'd, some knowledge. I mean, you'd, you'd worked in other sports football, most notably, before then. You know, you covered that, that whole tour and, and say, well, what was it about the tour that, that fascinated you and, and what, what surprised you about it as well as you kind of got to know it and love it? Well, I guess, first, firstly, the scale of the event, because um, 
Daniel, you've, you've been on the Tour de France, you've, you've done it many times, and I'm sure amongst our audience here, and that, and that bloke sitting over there on his own, hello mate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where he is, it doesn't matter, don't ask him. Um, uh, anyway, I'm sure, I'm sure amongst us all we've all, you know, been and seen the Tour de France, and, and it's only when you actually see it face to face you realise quite, quite the scale of the operation. So, in terms of what I do, broadcasting for a television network, what's called the zone technique, which is the TV compound area that you guys occasionally allowed access to, you print journalists, but you know, um, the, the, just the size of that, the number of big TV trucks and the amount of cabling and different countries represented there is comparable only, I think, I mean, it's way bigger than a World Cup final in football would, would be, way bigger. Hey. It's much bigger than a Champions League final, probably double the amount of trucks. Um, I think it's comparable to this kind of maybe a, a US presidential what? race, you know, in that, terms of the, I mean, it is me. just, it's just staggering. So in terms of the television side, I just went, my God. German television turns up year after year. They're, apparently, they're not interested in it anymore, so they've kind of scaled back their presence. But they have 85 television vehicles on the race every year. I mean, we don't. We've got three. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so the scale was just breathtaking. The Lance Armstrong, of course, 2003, that was his fifth win. So his stock was possibly never higher than then, and the interest in him was vast. And everywhere he went, he was just descended upon by hundreds and hundreds of journalists. I mean, it was as if David Beckham had signed for Real Madrid every day of the week, three times. You know, it was, it was kind of, that blew me away. And then, and the sort of flip side of that, and it's perhaps contradictory, but the access yeah, I, I, I got that. to these riders, um, having worked in a, a, the very sanitized world of football where you can't get near the buggers, um, uh, just just amazed me that you could go and knock on their doors, find out which hotel room they were sleeping in, because they'd tell you at reception. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. What rooms? Um. Yeah. Well, there's a list well, on the wall. Yeah. There's the curious a list. things about the. the just tour, nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Just nuts. So yeah. all all that thrilled me and excited me, and um, and over the years, you know, I, the the penny drop that actually, as a as a broadcast journalist and obviously as a written journalist, not only are you granted huge access to this great occasion, but you can actually drive the agenda and even determine the outcome of the race. When I think of the way we persecuted Michael Rasmussen in 2007, we ultimately were the motor that got him booted off the race. If we hadn't been doing our job in the way that we did it, someone else would have won. You know, so that, and that doesn't happen in football. You can't step on the pitch and get involved. But in cycling, you kind of can. The, line, the lines are, are far more line, blurred. The lines they? are blurred yeah. and they're fascinating. Yeah, and there is that, that paradoxical element to it, the scale on one, on one hand and the the access on the other. And one of the, the things that comes out in your book is, is your relationships with the riders as, as they develop. You or know, not. Yeah. Or not. Yeah. yeah. Or, or appear to develop. And then, it, I mean, it's very much like, you know, your story of your, your, your dealings with Mark Cavendish, for example. It's, it's like a courtship, you know, where we... We're, <laughs> one side. <laughs> we're a one-sided courtship. <laughs> unrequited love. Yeah, yeah. But you feel it's requited on, on, on occasions, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's fascinating how... And it, it does... It, it's a very interesting kind of... Um, study of, of how journalists interact with those athletes. I think you've probably got some thoughts on that as well, Daniel, because you obviously, for those that don't know, uh, Daniel is, is Mark Cavendish's ghost, so to speak. He Boy Racer, Mark Cavendish's book, was actually his. written by this fella. I collaborated. I dotted a few eyes. Boy Racer was written by he this fella. He sorted out the grammar and the spelling <laughs> and stuff. Um, but yeah, so you know, you know Mark very well, but what comes across in the book is, is your crush on Cavendish. <laughs> Um, and, well, and there is well. this kind of very, and then it's followed up in your follow-up book, a mini book, which is mm. how Cav won the green jersey, jersey which was an e-book published last year. Um, you know, it's, it's fascinating. That like, can you tell us a little bit about well, how, I, how, no, you, I'm just how you and Mark briefly, have developed? I'd like to know, come to you in a second. But um, I, I've repeatedly, I mean, Mark and I have this game where I ask him for his mobile phone number, and he says no. I've got it actually. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> but that's the interesting thing. So I've, I mean, every time I've seen him last year, gone, can I have your mobile phone number? He goes, no. So, and then I say, well, I'll ask you again in 20 minutes, see what you say. So I go, can I have your mobile phone number? No, you can't. And but, this but, goes on and on. And, but things seem to be going really well for you at certain points. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but that's the funny thing about Mark. He does kind of blow, you on. blow hot and cold. And, and, you know, he never gives you anything other than compelling television, I think. Whether he's, in fact, he's at his most compelling when he's got the right ass with you, because that's when you see the true. You know, it makes my job slightly uncomfortable, but it's, I'm not there to be his mate. I'm there to kind of be the lightning conductor and the filter through which we experience 
what he is as a person, what drives him. And I think that comes across most when he's got the arse with you, which is quite often. How uncomfortable are those moments? Oh, hideously. It sucks the air out of the room. I mean, it's just, you know, when Mark doesn't want, and you, you know, I'm interested in your take on this, when he doesn't want to cooperate or when he thinks you are letting yourself down or not paying him enough respect or failing to understand him or just being daft, which is quite often, he just has a way of shutting down the, the communication, doesn't he? That is quite, quite unique. I mean, did you find that even in your, you know, when you were writing the book with him? I think he's very fickle. He tends to make up his mind about people, and he's obviously made up his mind about you. <laughs> <laughs> but if he likes you, he tends to be fine. I mean, I remember uh, about a year or two ago, I, you know, I'd done the whole book with him, and it was, you know, we got on pretty well. Um, wouldn't call us friends, but we have a good professional relationship. And um, I had to do a magazine feature with him, and I called him up and asked him a couple of questions, and. Asked him one question, I think it was about a race, Milan San Remo last year or the year before. And there was a bit, there was a pause on the end of the phone. It was a phone interview. He said, Daniel, I don't think I've said this to you before. That was a fucking stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I mean, that's kind of typical of him, isn't it? Like, like you say, even when he's pissed off, yeah. um, it can be very compelling. Incidentally, I've got his mobile phone number now because another journalist gave it to me and said, hey, by the way, here. Like but, no, but I've never used it. I'm far too proud to use it now because it hasn't come from him, so I'm not going to use it. But I'll sell it to anyone in this room for about a tenner. <laughs> or anyone in the or anyone, yeah, even Google sphere. Oh, no, that's just us now. Yeah. 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 Um, the other guys disappeared. <laughs> um, but th- no, that, that's, that's one very interesting aspect. And, and these characters are, are kind of a big part of, of the story that you tell in the book, Lance Armstrong being, being another one. Um, I mean, you've obviously covered lots of major sports. How does Lance Armstrong compare to some of the kind of A-listers in football, for example? Oh, uh, Armstrong's, in the same way that Cavendish is a bundle of contradictions, so too is Armstrong. But, I mean, Armstrong, I'm, I've lost interest in him a bit now, but that's only quite recently. I mean, I found him absolutely compelling in all sorts of different ways because he, you know, I found tussling with him on the finish line a different kind of experience because he was, he was quite even-tempered. But he um, he had this way of uh, fixing you with a little glare and uh, lying through his teeth to you like that. Uh, and you kind of knew it was a lie. And he knew that you knew it was a lie. But we were playing this game and, and it, was how it was sort of dancing around that that was such fun with him. I mean, I did, for all we think of his record as an athlete, good and bad, um, he was he was compelling, I think. To, to watch in all, in all situations. Shall we, shall we kind of segue very, yeah. very smoothly from, from talking about Armstrong to talking about the rider to whom Five-time Armstrong champions. was yeah. perhaps compared the most? Um, the cannibal, Eddie Merckx, the greatest cyclist of them all, who, who you know, strangely enough, for, for you know, Merckx and, and Armstrong are kind of rivals through, through history in a sense. Merckx is generally acknowledged as the greatest cyclist of all time. And, and Armstrong, though, during his reign was regularly kind of mentioned as perhaps the greatest cyclist of all time. Can you maybe just tell us a little bit about <clears throat> your approach to this book? Because Marx didn't cooperate as such with it, did he? No, he, um, he told me pretty much from the outset that he, he wouldn't collaborate. I don't think that's that unusual with biographies, I think. Um, and it kind of freed me up, really. Um, I didn't... He's, he's one of these people who's really dehumanised, you no, know, kind of demystified himself. Um, over the last 30, 40 years since he's been retired, kind of disappointingly, a bit like Pele, you know, with his Viagra adverts and, um, and you awesome. know, the nonsense he talks, yeah, MasterCard and the nonsense he talks about current Brazilian footballers. So um, Mertz is quite a, a disappointing character. But when you juxtapose that with his achievements, which are just extraordinary, and the person he turned into when he was on a bike, um, that in itself was fascinating. But it was really that that I wanted to concentrate on because, you know, we're not that interested in... Well, I mean, goes back to what you were saying about um, your interactions with these guys. We're not that interested in them as human beings. We're interested in them because they can do things that we can't. And that was very much the case with Merckx. Um, so, and another thing that I really wanted to tell was the story of all the people's lives, careers he ruined. I mean, he sounds like a despot, and he kind of was on a bike. And there was this whole generation of, of guys um, who could and probably thought when they were 19, 20, 21 that they were going to be, you know, Muhammad Ali on a bike or, you know, Pele on a bike. And um, that didn't happen. It was interesting, really, looking at how that shaped them as characters and actually made them more complete characters than Merckx. And Merckx sort of remained this kind of Peter Pan who never grew up because, you know, 
losing is an experience. We all have setbacks in our lives, but Merck's managed to keep a lid on everything and kind of remain in his own mind, immortal, invulnerable, um, until the age of about 32, 33, when he finally lost for the first time and then couldn't deal with it, found it very, very difficult to deal with. Can I just ask Daniel, I mean, having to learn about cycling history in the way that I have to because I didn't watch it first time around, you know, and anyway, Merckx was before my time, but um, what I really got from your, your book was a sense of a rider who could do it on all terrains, and that's, you know, kind of remarkable in the modern era to think back to a rider who did that. So he could time trial like no other, he could win rolling intermediate stages, he won in the high mountains, and he could win a bunch sprint. What would he, if, if you chucked Eddie Merckx on, onto a carbon fibre bike and stuck him in the, in, in the modern peloton, where would he find his, what would he do? What would he achieve and, and you know, where, where would that take him? Um, it's a good question. I actually just wrote a, a magazine feature about this, but um, I think the way cycling has gone, it's become so specialised, kind of disappointingly so, um, to the extent where a guy now will, will literally dedicate six months, if not a year, to one race, and he will think, be thinking about that race the whole time. He'll be developing his bike, you know, with a view to that race. He'll be getting coaching with a view to that race, and that really wasn't the case, and, and that kind of falsified Merckx's achievements when you place them, you know, when you compare them to, to achievements nowadays. He probably wasn't as good pound for pound in the Tour de France as, you know, whoever wins it this year will be. You know, he would lose. He would, because he was never as fit, I don't think, as the guys are now. But he, you know, he was good enough throughout the year to, to beat those guys because they didn't, didn't have access to those things. So the modern sport would force him, if you like, to specialise, to choose one of those routes. And what would be that route, do you think? I mean, what was his, what, what was his single greatest strength? Was he... I mean, I think... Would he be Miguel Indurain? Would he, you know, would he... Would he have... I think he would be a one-day racer. I mean, he was... He's a fairly big guy, sort of six foot, weighs 75 kilos. Um, I would imagine that he would concentrate on the classics, the one-day races in, in the springtime. Right. Yeah. He'd be a far more limited rider then, wouldn't he? And he probably wouldn't have the, the respect that, yeah. that is his due. I mean, he's not... Um, because you couldn't imagine him really going head-to-head -head with some of the great climbers. What, what, why, why were the, those great climbers not able to really put him on the ropes back in the day? I mean, they, they sort of were, but um, again, I think there was another, another aspect of it was this aura. And, and he, particularly the first year when he won the Tour de France 1969, he really traumatized people. There was actually, I, I quote a guy, um, one of his old team managers in my book, saying he actually, you know, they were shell-shocked. Not just for a few weeks, but for years afterwards. And one of the things they said to me was, they would never, they would not dare to attack because it was literally like dangling bait in front of him. And as soon as you attack, that was literally like lighting the. Tell, the us, tell us a great story about the, the wine, Zandegu and the wine. Yeah. Oh, the, the two with him, well, oh, it's, it's difficult to tell, but. Um, <laughs> no, I, I mean, you know, in bike races, Tour de France, now you get the hotspot sprints for points for the green jersey. But it, was, it used to be very common for other spot prizes to be up for grabs, like you know bottles of wine. Or in, on this particular occasion in the Tour of Italy, they, were, they went past this um, and a famous Italian singer's chateau or um, kind of castle manor house they had, and he was putting up 50 bottles of Chianti for the winner of this sprint. And this um, uh, the Italian rider Dino Zandigu, who became a bit of a folk hero because he was just he was a circus act, you know he would you know um, appear holding birthday cakes in the middle of the race and singing happy birthday. And Anyway, so um, this one day, he'd resolved that he was going to win this county. He said that when, whenever there was wine up for grabs, um, and I, this is something that I kind of picked up when I interviewed him because um, you could kind of tell he was, he was fond of a glass of he, county. He got, dr <laughs> he, he got drunk during the course of the day. Then. Yeah, 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 yeah. But he was particularly motivated for this kind of sprint. So this, on this one day, he described it in perfect detail, you know, coming around a bridge and... And um, there, there it was, the banner, and he could see it, and, it, and off he went. And he was a sprinter anyway, so he, on this particular occasion, he managed to beat Merckx. Completely meaningless. Merckx was going to win the race. Um, he was minutes ahead on the general classification. And he started, and as, when he saw Zandiga cross the line, he was screaming, you bastardo, you'll never race again, oh, I'm going to kill you. Um, <laughs> that, can, that can't is mine. Anyway, that night, um, they, got, they were all staying in the same, team hot um, same hotel, all the teams up a, up a mountain. And um, Merck's knocked on his door and demanding half of the Chianti. Otherwise, he, would, he was going to see to it that, that this guy would never race again. But that's kind of, 
Yeah, I, I, I'm sure there's a degree of truth in that, but I'm not sure. The other, the other day, he, he beat Marks again and, and had he to beat Marks hide again in somebody's he, house. He had to. He pulled off the road just off the finish line, and he, he burst into a, this little wooden shack near the finish line and a d completely deserted house, and he went upstairs, and there was a, an 80-year-old woman asleep, and he, she started screaming. He said, Gram Granny, Granny, don't worry. The, I'm not going to do anything to you, but... Um, Eddie Merckx is chasing me and he wants to rip my face off. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon he stayed there for an hour. I mean, I don't, didn't believe a word of it, but I hope, <laughs> I hope I present it in the book in such a way that... I think um, we get, yeah, you yeah. get the sense that Xander yeah. is this, this circus act. Um, but it's interesting because paradoxically, Merckx, he, you know, the way you describe him there, he's sort of a mafia boss or a, a bully. And yet he's quite a gentle um, guy as well. He's, he's got this... And he's racked by insecurity and doubt himself, you know, that which is, is in contrast to this this marauding, bullying bike rider and, and a race with well, it. That's no different from lots of bike riders, is it? There's a life on the calendar. There's a life on the bike and there's a life yeah. off the bike. But and, apart from Lance Armstrong, who who yeah. kind of had that took, that he took, took his it on off, bike off. persona into his off yeah, bike. And, yeah, and you know, Armstrong was probably well, you know, and then Armstrong was was the next. Guy, that's nice. Nice. That's that's nice. Nice. Have you written a book about Nerd Enough? That, 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 that was completely <laughs> accidental. That was totally accidental. Well, should, we, should we ask him about yeah. that? Let's ask him about that. Oh, because goodness, if all, you must. Ask him. <laughs> so Richard's book is called Slaying the Badger. Now, the badger is Bernard Hino. Yeah. And Rich, do you want to explain, first of all, how he got this nickname, why it's appropriate? I don't, I don't think the reason why he got the nickname owes to the person he became in a way. It's kind of odd. No. The origins of it were apparently that you know when he was a young cyclist, um, a teammate um, from from Brittany used to, you know, greet him, "Hey Badger, Hey Blairo." It's quite common in France, it's isn't it? Currently in Brittany, it's a common form of greeting, "Hey Badger." <laughs> Odd. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, but with with Eno, this kind of stuck, and it, you know, we, I think, I had this image of a badger as this cuddly kind of um, toy, and, and a badger is really pretty vicious, apparently, and, and the the jaw kind of once it 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 um, clamps something, you can only get it off by dislocating the jaw, apparently. And that sums up Eno to a T. You know, he, he grew into that nickname and, and it caught on. And, and you know, you know when, when, um, when I went with a, a good friend, stroke translator of mine, uh, Daniel, to interview him, you know, we asked him, D you, you quite liked it though, didn't you? You quite liked the nickname. And he goes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of, I think it kind of suited me. I, he said, Badger's a little bit nasty like me, he said. Yeah. Um, and that is, so it does kind of sum him up, yeah. yeah. In terms, in terms of what happened on a bike, sorry, Daniel. Um, when I um, when I, I read your book a while ago, and then when I've been reading Daniel's, um, the way in the general classification, Merckx would make decisive moves that would nowadays, in, in the modern era, be considered suicidal because they just go off with 100 kilometres to go on their own and just kind of win it. Let's get this done. Let's just do it. Eno was the same, right? I mean, repeatedly, that would yeah. be his modus operandi. To a point, in the early part of his career, certainly. And it's interesting because Eno retired, i uh, sorry, Merckx retired in 78, the year that Eno rode his first and won his first Tour de France. And, and I think Oncatil had retired the year that Merckx also won his first Tour, was it? Or there was some neat cutoff, anyway, between these eras. And there was the Oncatil era, followed by the Merckx era, followed almost... Um, directly afterwards by the Eno era. And Eno was, yeah, he, he, he was so physically capable, I think, that early on in his career, you know, he realized he could win big races, and, and he, he, he was quite aggressive. Um, he suffered a bad knee injury in 1980, um, and it caused him to withdraw from the, the tour midway through when he was wearing the yellow jersey um, in the dead of night, actually, after the, the journalists had done their stories for the next day. Eno um, orchestrated this, this exit, which didn't go down very well. With the journalists, um, and and that and, and after that he was a slightly different kind of rider. Um, he did go to the World Championships that year and won it in that kind of um, style, that buccaneering style. But he was he was more calculating afterwards, and that 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 calculation um, extended to, to to individual races, but also to his kind of career. He became more far more selective, not quite as selective as Lance Armstrong, who only rode the Tour to win each year, but far more selective than Merckx had been. Um, you know, he, he set his sights on, he had, he had appointments, appointments, and when he turned up for an appointment, he won it every time. You know, he, he, would, he would say, I'm going to win that race, and he would, he would go and win it. And, uh, and at other races, he would sort of become this incredible teammate to, his, um, to, to lesser riders who he would help and act as this incredible domestique. And, uh, you know, uh, speaking to his former teammates, they were 
they spoke so kind of warmly, even lovingly of him, which again is in, in stark contrast to the image that we had of him and the image that his rivals had of him, because he was, he, was he was a brute and a bully. Particularly in this Tour de France that your book is about. Yeah, the, the book's about the 86 tour where um, he and the American Greg LeMond lined up in the same La Vie Claire team. The previous year in 85, um, Eno had won his fifth tour, um, but he'd done so with, with the help of LeMond. I mean, he probably wouldn't have won that tour had LeMond not, not helped him. He had a terrible crash in St. Etienne and sort of finished the race with a broken nose, bronchitis, two black eyes. He looked brilliant, but he, 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 <laughs> sort of, he struggled to the line and, and LeMond had helped him. And, and Le Mans probably had his chance to win that tour, and he, he held back on team orders in order to help Eno. And Eno allegedly promised him that he would help him the following year, which was Eno's final tour, 86. Um, he made this pledge to help Le Mans to win it, and he made it to several people, Le Mans himself and, and to journalists. But of course, as the 86 tour approaches, people are starting to question whether Eno will honor the, the pledge. And he has, you know, the, the president of France urging him to forget about it, the whole of the French um, media and people really, you know, forget about the American, you know, go for the sixth tour, which would have been historic, uh, you know, put him out in front of Merckx and Oncatil as a six-time winner. So the temptation was huge, um, and really as the tour began, it, was, it seemed to be very much open. And as it began and as it went into its first week and then hit the Pyrenees, it became very, very obvious to everybody, especially Le Monde, that Eno was not going to help Le Monde. He was out to try and win it himself. And so what followed was this fascinating kind of um, internal battle between them and, and their own team. And, and the team, you know, ended up being split um, down the middle, really, um, with the Swiss riders in the middle as neutrals. Um, and it, it was, yeah, fascinating. Two very contrasting characters. But you had two very contrasting experiences of interviewing them, no? <laughs> Talk a little bit about Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, again, paradox. Le Monde is very open and, and friendly and, and warm, whereas Eno is very cold and coarse and 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 uh, and short and uh, I went to interview Le Monde you know the book is it's funny because the book is about Le Monde and Eno but Eno is the person that really seems to fascinate people but Le Monde is equally fascinating in his own way he was this kind of young prodigy who wasn't streetwise in the way that Eno was he was just hugely hugely talented but he was racked by insecurity by doubt by fragility and this so it was it was not just a physical Backed battle. by diarrhea at one point. Right by diarrhea. It was not just a physical battle between them, it was a psychological battle. Are you trying to get me to read this? No, I'm not, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the, the, you know, and, and Le Monde, yeah, you know, I went to interview Le Monde and, and he was just, you know, he, he'd been very hard to pin down initially. You know, nine months I think it took me to arrange an interview with him and to go and see him. And once I was face to face with him, he couldn't have been better. You know, he was brilliant. Um, and just the, the stories that would come out of him and you know, were just incredible, but such a contrast to, to Eno. He's become more, because Eno, you know, did subject him to a very, um, a pretty horrendous experience during that tour. You know, I think it was, it was pretty, it was pretty hard, pretty harrowing, but he's kind of softened to Eno over the years. He's kind of forgiven him in a way, because I think he understands now why Eno did it, why it was important to him. I don't think, I think, for Eno to have been seen to be just basically riding in the service of Le Monde, I think would have probably damaged Eno's, Eno's legacy. And I think Eno kind of, on some level, re realized that. And so the only way for him to help Le Monde or to be beaten was to kind of go down all guns blazing in the way that he did, I think. If, if Eno kind of rationalized it, I think that's probably what he did. And still the last French winner of the, of the Tour, which is just extraordinary, isn't it? Which is, is that a way of bring things up to date and maybe just sort of throwing it open um, to, I mean, there may be no questions, in which case we're happy to ramble on. We can ramble on all day. Can read, if anyone I, can wants to, the, um, I can read the diarrhea story. Yeah, go, go, go for it. Yeah. Oh, Merckx is not a ghost. It's not an autobiography. It's a biography. No collaboration no. from him. He said he no. Said no. Yeah. no, I didn't want <laughs> No, not at all. Um, how did it work? So, I mean, I think people do it. Rich has done a couple of ghostwriting jobs. Come on. Yeah. Okay. But we, um, I think they work broadly the same way. Um, 
so I spent about a week with Mark. Um, we, it's too long to do like a whole day. Um, so you do maybe two hours in the morning, two hours at night, and you know that gives you a number of hours. And then you, you know, we probably did 20, 25 hours in total. Um, but he was generally fine. Um, the most alarm, well, there are a lot of alarming moments in in the process. I would say. Um, that the one that sticks in my mind will always be, and you've probably heard the story, I've told this story to so many people, but when I'd finished the manuscript, and well, his girlfriend, and that's a, and how that overlapped with the book, is that that's another good story. But, um, <laughs> um, we get that yeah, we can get that one. <laughs> there might be, there might be. Um, bear with me, I'll just... But, um, yeah, so I'd finished the manuscripts and I went to see Mark. And Melissa, his girlfriend at the time, was, you know, I knew her because I'd been at their house a lot. And um, she was, and she would generally be my point of contact when I couldn't. He was sometimes a nightmare. I remember one day saying, I was at the end of my tether, I couldn't get hold of him. And she sent me, I sent her a message, can you please get him to call me? She sent me one back, that lying little git. I've had just about enough of this. <laughs> but anyway, we, we, um, we finished the manuscript, and I went to meet them in Manchester and um, just to get a bit of feedback from them about you know, what they thought about it. And you know, we ordered drinks in this bar, and we're sitting there, and Melissa's there, and Mark's there. I said, so guys, how was it? What did you think of it? And um, Cal was saying, yeah, yeah, great, Daniel, great, loved it. And... Um, and I turned to Melissa and said, what about you, Melissa? And she said, well, you know, there are a few things that happened that you've described them. Um, it wasn't exactly the way they happened, like, you know, the way Mark proposed to me. At this stage, I could see the fury that Ned's probably familiar with in Mark's eyes. <laughs> and he turned to her, and there was a pause of about 10 seconds. And he went, Melissa, it's a fucking story. <laughs> I, I said, hang on, Mark, you didn't know this. It's not fictional. <laughs> Um, but yeah, generally it was fine. <laughs> and, the, and the thing about yeah, the, the girlfriend, I'm not sure you want to go in, into really. I mean, um, he happened to dedicate it to Melissa and yeah, you're right. Actually, I do remember now. Yeah, I mean, he, he happened to split up with Melissa um, just as the hardback came out, which was unfortunate. <laughs> Jump in the queue. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, well, I think it's. I mean, we talked about this, haven't we, briefly? But I, I think it's. Um, there's only one answer. That's thoroughly compromised, isn't it? I mean, but whichever way you look at it, it's compromised. If they pull it off, it'll be astonishing. But they, I don't know. I don't think they will pull it off, and it kind of. Yeah, it's a different era. They were all doping for a start. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, and um, and and then for, for all that they did pull it off, they also did you know didn't pull it off as well. You know, it didn't like it wasn't like the recipe that worked every every single time. Let's not forget how Jan Ulrich kind of used to used to try and throw down a, a, his opposition to Lance Armstrong in this kind of team full of chiefs and uh, sorry Indians and no chiefs. You know, um, it it um, it's it, it's fr it's frustrating me because I. The more and more I think about this year's Tour de France and the way that the, the tour has been designed with the two long time trials in the absence of Alberto Contador, the more I think that this is Bradley Wiggins only and best chance of winning the Tour de France. And if Dave Brailsford, when he called Team Sky into existence, if his uh, stated aim of producing a British Tour de France winner within five years uh, had any credibility, then this is the moment. You know? And I think that they should really be throwing the kitchen sink at Bradley Wiggins and his, and his tour. Um, where the desire and the impulse and the motor actually came from to sign Mark Cavendish on this multi-million pound contract, which in one sense seems entirely obvious, but where that came from, I don't know. How high up within the organisation of Sky you have to go, whether it actually came from Dave Brailsford himself or someone above him, I don't know. The irony is I think that it was almost, you know, the, the move was engineered um, at a time when there were serious doubts about whether that aim of winning the tour was actually achievable. Absolutely. You know, so, 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 the, so it looked the, like a very solid plan B. Yeah, anyway, so yeah. the move was, was, uh, was basically done at the, in the first part of last year on the back of Wiggins having quite a spectacular failure at the 2010 tour when it really didn't look at that point that he was ever going to actually become a tour winner. 
And if somebody did emerge as a potential tour winner, it would be a bit further down the line. You know, Camdish is your banker for, for lots of wins, lots of publicity. And then, you know, they sign Camdish and Wiggins then, you know, finishes third in the, in the Vuelta with Chris Froome second. And suddenly, you know, um, I, you, but I can see, I can understand why, why they would sign Camdish, you know, the, the, the most bankable name in world cycling, really. And there is still, you know, still an element of, that the momentum seems to be building towards, you know, Wiggins certainly starting the tour as a favourite. Mm. And, you know, some people now are talking about it being his to lose, which... I'm not sure that... I'm that would sure be overstating that. it. No, I, think, I think so, because... Yeah, you, you, Cadell you, Evans is still probably the, the favourite, given think, his experience. You know, you can... With someone who's... With Lance Armstrong, there was an element of certainty, because, yeah. you know... Uh, but with Wiggins, he's, you know, finishing third in the Vuelta last year, I don't think is enough solid proof that he can win the tour. Um, winning Pyrenees is not enough solid evidence that he can win the tour, but I think he's definitely capable of doing it. But, um, and I think you're right that it has to be a concerted effort to, I think that the way it's, it's going, that I suspect they might, you know, Cavendish might be kind of winging it a little bit and not have the, the, the lead out train and, and be left to his own devices. I don't know if you... I think the big problem could be groups within the group. I think basically the problem is that and what the guys at T-Mobile used to say is they had to do two jobs. And, and, and what ended up deciding who they worked for that day or in that particular moment when they felt you know, pulled in two directions was often who they liked more. And that is another issue. Um, I think Mark's probably more of a natural leader than Bradley. Um, but Mark also pisses people off, can piss people off, um, although he's a great leader. So that's another thing they've got to guard against, whether... You know, um, just the, in terms of morale in the team, if the if all these guys who are doing the kind of worker bees, if they get really tired and they get down, and people's moods are kind of fickle in the Tour de France because they're so tired, then I think it will be difficult to manage. Maybe the other, the other factor. I'll come to you in a second, just to throw in. You may be maybe preempting your question here, but you, know, you mentioned his name briefly. Is Chris Froome? And he might end up being the story of the summer. We're focusing on Wiggins and, and Cavendish, but he's a big unknown. You know, he's, he's had Bill Hazier. Re his re recurrent Bill Hazier, and then he came down with pneumonia and then he got rid of that and he went off to Kenya to his brother's wedding and came back with typhoid so he's been wiped out <coughs> for months but he's Pretty in full training now and he's off on the tour of Romandy so he could be capable of anything or nothing but if, if he's capable of anything that anything might just be winning the Tour de France if it's like the Vuelta last year where he, like was, the stronger where he was the where he was the stronger Wigan. of the two Let's, sorry, and he can, and he can time trial, in the sorry. blue shirt oh, yeah. And recently, has it really dropped my interest? I think it was because I felt everybody was using drugs and doping in online. Question to you, since you've been so closely involved today, has it also been in the, in the past the likes of the Mercs? And e, what is your view? Should um, doping be fully legalized? Everybody could use drugs or <laughs> to some extent be legalized? Or because right now I feel after six months after Tour de France, okay, this guy's another, you know, like it becomes so. I mean, there's no doubt that drugs have been in cycling from the start, pretty much. I mean, strychnine and was it strychnine, caffeine, you know, yeah. from the start. Morphine. Morphine, yeah. yeah. Alcohol. Yeah. Game. So, um, and, and I mean, one misconception, one of the things I talk about in my book is that um, it used to be they... Now you, they refer to it as light doping, i.e. like stimulants and caffeine, and whereas now it's heavy doping. Because I think there's a, people have made a leap in their minds because now it's syringes and it kind of seems slightly sordid, blood bags, you know, these shadowy doctors. Whereas back then it was, you know, it, it seemed quite innocent in a way. But it's always been there. And that is a misconception. You know, the, a lot of the methods and products that are around now were around 30, 40 years ago. It's just that... We've stigmatized it in a way by um, making the punishments more draconian. You know, we say now it's two years, four years, and all, all of a sudden in people's minds, God, this is a really terrible crime. Whereas if you say, uh, you know, you're banned for a week, then people start to view it as something that's kind of trifling. Eddie Merck's got a month, right? Well, and then it was, yeah, yeah he didn't even get the month, yeah. So that's one element. Yeah, um... <laughs> I, I would suggest, in the, even in the 10 years I've been covering it, actually, and I understand entirely what you're saying, you, you're right to feel that in some ways, but I, I would 
suggest hesitantly that actually incrementally over those 10 years, the instances of doping have come down year on year. And even those instances where people have doped, uh, I think probably the percentage of advantage they're gaining is probably smaller. In other words, the conclusion I'm you know, trying to draw is that uh, it's getting better. And so what do you do? do you, is this to the point to give up on it? I mean, I'm not sure it is. I think that probably the, uh, it's heading in the right direction, albeit slowly. I'm reasonably confident that clean riders are winning big races now in a way that I wasn't 10 years ago. Yeah. When I say clean, um, it's all relative. I mean, we have this, we have, well, I, I'm not sort of uh, casting any aspersions there at all, but, you know, we have this very black and white view of doping, you know, that you're either a drugs cheat or you're, you're not. And it's just so complex, you know, the, there's this huge grey area and the actual line between doping and clean is, is moving all the time. And, you know, this is something I covered in another book about Team Sky where, you know, it's very obvious that if you're a professional athlete, if you're trying to win the Tour de France, it's your job to go as close to that line as possible and to do everything that you can that is legal, but which might not be considered natural or even ethical, I don't know, um, by some people. You know, the athletes at that level are doing things and taking things that the rest of us would regard as, as, as crazy. Um, but it's kind of their responsibility to do that. They would be, they'd be kind of silly not to, I think, in a way. Um, so I, I think it's a, it's a very foggy area, and, and there isn't this kind of, an athlete doesn't decide, right, I'm going to dope today. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go from being a clean rider to a cheat. I think, as David Miller very eloquently describes in his book, it's a process. But there's always this, this puzzle, this, this, this game of being as close to that line as you can possibly be. The other thing I'd say is that um, there is this misconception that the media knows that we, it's a charge that's often leveled us that, you know, we spend time with these athletes. We do have really good access, like Ned said earlier. We don't know. We have no idea. And the athletes themselves have no idea what another guy, in some cases they might, but, you know, at the Tour de France, the press room is you will not ever walk into a more cynicism fueled room. Um, every, you know, we will watch the, the stage in the, um, on the big screen, and you know, as soon as anyone does something incredible, there'll be a nudge, nudge, and a wink, wink. But really, we don't know. And it's often, it's, rumors. yeah, and often we're basing that on stereotypes. You know, like yeah, sometimes you'll be live to a. I mean, I don't want to dwell on this, too, but you will be live to a decent rumor that you can follow through and actually effect a challenge. I mean, that does happen. It's yeah. rare. It happened with, with me and uh, Stefan Schumacher after his time trial win, where I basically accused him of doping. Yeah. He was wearing the yellow jersey at the tour. He didn't like it one bit, but, yeah. but, but I was right, and he was wrong. And he was, you know, yeah. uh, it, it doesn't always happen. I mean, you've got to be pretty sure of your ground. Yeah. Happened with Rasmussen, didn't it? I mean, albeit he never failed a dope test. But um, Sorry, can I just come to this? Do you think the, uh, the relative inconsistency of some riders Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Doesn't look good. Dangerous to make any assumption, isn't it? I mean, because we can make the same assumption about Chris Froome, who rode into, third third in the, into second in the Vuelta last year. But we knew that he'd been ill and that he'd had these t this terrible bad luck. So, you know, uh, it's a very British mindset, perhaps. Um, you know, the, the cheating foreigners and the, the plucky Brits. Um, so, you know, we, we're, I think it's always dangerous to make assumptions one way or the other. Um, there could be a logical explanation. I mean, Gilbert's apparently had dental problems. That, that could explain it. Who knows? Um, Inconsistency, though, is or, or, or massive leap in improvement. Thomas, Verk all, Thomas Verkliff. is always suspicious. Yeah. Tom Bonin. This well, year. there's an interesting little bit in your book, your your new book, the yeah. the, the e-book, um, where you have a conversation with a, an ASO official who suggests that. Well, I mean, on the last year's tour, there was this funny moment where it almost became a possibility that Thomas Verkliff would win the Tour de France. I mean, having been not up for consideration, that it just flickered for a second. Hang on, this ain't going to happen, is it? After 10 days in yellow? At which point I said, um, I said to this guy, he's very high up in the organization, I said, uh, What's his name? <laughs> <laughs> Mathieu Perez. <laughs> and uh, I said, um, <coughs> I said, that would be a thing, wouldn't it? Out of nowhere, a Frenchman, after all this time, winning on, you know, with, with two days from Paris. 
This could happen. And he went, I hope it doesn't happen. This needs to stop now. And I went, no. And he goes, <laughs> no, I, don't, I don't know. He's not party to any information, but he's sensitive to those insinuations and to the image of the tour. Yeah. It's yeah. on YouTube, Ned. You know that, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bleep that bit out. Okay. Yeah. More time to think, I think. I actually think that cycling is one of the sports that's least um, vulnerable to that kind of thing because uh, I think the sport where you feel that most is probably something like golf where you're stationary because you've... Uh, this is... No, no, seriously. No, because it's also... It's a physiological <sighs> thing. It's a hormonal thing um, that, you know, if you're moving, if you're moving fast, you're producing hormones which will ultimately, often, they will... Um, kind of muffle the stress, you know, like adrenaline and stuff, that works against stress a lot of the time, although it can make you more nervous. But I think that generally... Sport, Daniel. Um, <laughs> uh, I, but yeah, outside of, well. outside of the when they're actually performing, yeah, I think, I think all sportsmen are very susceptible I, I to I think, it. though, that the, the, the self-doubt thing, it can be the difference between, you know, you saw it with Ulrich and Armstrong, you know, most or any Le Monde, you know, any rivalry where that's really exposed, and often the difference is is confidence, self confidence. And actually, there was a really good case in point just the other week, wasn't there, with Johnny Hugeland? I mean, I don't know how closely you've been following this season, but he's a kind of marauding. He doesn't quite know what he is, kind of rider, but he's got bundles of aggression and a lot of talent. Um, and in Milan San Remo, he kept attacking at kind of slightly inappropriate places and having a go. And, and, and actually, his DS came out and said he's doing that because his self-confidence is brittle, because he doesn't know how to get the best out of himself. And, it's know. ironic, isn't it? We could see it, I think, with Pantani as well. You know, some of these great, you know, really exciting climbers are often the ones who are, often, are most racked by, by self-doubt. And they're not happy unless they are, you know, if they're sitting in the bunch waiting for things to happen, they're not, they're not happy. And... You know, it takes a very confident rider to actually just sit there and, and control the race. And, and, you know, someone like Armstrong who would decide this is the key moment in the race is where I'm going to yeah. set it alight and, and do that. But it's interesting that some people can turn that into fuel and other people, for other people it will just kill their performances. I mean, that was with Merckx. He was just as wrapped with self-doubt as any, as any rider you will ever find. The nature of cycling, in particular with the, the hours training and racing, it does... It does if you're an introspective sort, it's going to make make you worse. I think climb, you know, climbing is the same. Some, I think that's why there's some really good, not not these ones obviously, but there are some really good books about cycling, because you, the, there is that time to think, and and like there's great climbing literature as well, because people have this time to think and to, you know, David Miller's book, for example, is the product of, you know, years of introspection, and he's intelligent enough to be able to turn that introspection into this coherent. Story and and that that I think is a it is a, a fact of the sport that's definitely significant. The psychological fuel thing you said using it as a fuel. Uh, uh, just to quote Gary Imlach, who presents the, our coverage, who's I think a brilliant brilliant journalist. He once summed up Lance Armstrong at the end of one of our shows after he had that spat with Simeone in the best way possible. He said he said Lance Armstrong needs grudges like the flying Scotsman needs a steady supply of coal. <laughs> Which I thought was just yeah. brilliant. Oh, there's a brilliant. Yeah. Speaking of psychology, yeah. you talk uh, a little bit about the Schleck Brothers. <laughs> yeah. And he really disappointed me. I mean, he's the last, I mean, he disappointed me in so many ways, uh, you know, over the last couple of years. I think of the head to head against Contador on the Tourmalet in the pissing rain that just didn't happen. You know, maybe there were sporting reasons for that. I don't know. But where were the fireworks? Where was the attempt? Um, but the most disappointing mem recent memory I have of Andy Schleck is interviewing him on the Champs Elysees last year at the Tour when he finished in second. And I said, Andy, sum it all up. Now you're here, you've reached Paris. When you, when you look back in 10 years, what will you think about this tour? And he said, I'm, I'm immensely proud to have finished second in the Tour de France. <laughs> he should have won it. Last year, he should have won it, shouldn't he? And, you know, even if he's just trying to say the right thing, and I actually believe he's kind of 
he's got himself into that mindset where he, he actually is immensely proud of finishing second, which is all right. I mean, I, I've never finished second. You've never finished second. You know, it's a rare place to be. But with his talent, he should be... I mean, would Mark Cavendish say, I'm immensely proud to have finished second in this sprint? You know, and that's what kind of maddens me about Andy Schleck a little. But no, I was reading an interview with Andy Murray in Sport magazine earlier, and he said, in what other domain would you be the fourth best in the world at something and still be criticised? And I, I was writing about Andy Schleck yesterday, and this occurred to me. That we were very harsh about him, but actually he's the second best. You know, last year he was the second best rider in, in the biggest race in the world. It's, it's not bad. The other thing about the Schlecks is, I think if you go to Luxembourg, you start to understand what a goldfish bowl it is for them. I mean, Luxembourg is not exactly... The cup does not runneth over with other celebrities... And, um, you know, in any... Oh, this Frank. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Both live in the same house. Yeah. And then there was their dad, John. Yeah, exactly. Before that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, on the, well, that works both ways. On the one hand, you know, they're made for life. They don't... Yeah. They're, they're the biggest stars in the, um, in the country. Also, there's a lot of pressure. You know, there's a, a huge amount of pressure on them, especially with the team now having a kind of Luxembourg identity. But do you think they would be better I mean, it, it, yeah, you can see them riding, uh, certainly last year, I remember Plateau de Bay stage, where you felt that one would accelerate and then look to see where the other one was. Um, and they have that brotherly bond, which is both a help and a hindrance, really. Um, you know, you know, had could LMs not been riding last year, and had he not been riding as well as he was, and they would have probably finished first and second in, in the tour, and we'd have been saying this is remarkable, you know these wonderful brothers. Um, so, you know, it's, it's close to being an incredible story and I think it is a story of unfulfilled promise, really, um, at the moment. You know, when Andy Schleck emerged and finished second in the Giro as a 21-year-old or something in 2007, mm -hmm. um, we thought, my God, this guy is, you know, a bit like Jan Ulrich when he won the Tour in 97. It was, we thought, this, this guy is the new Merckx or, you know, or somebody is just so, so talented. Um, and you wouldn't have thought then that he would get to this age and not have and not have won a Grand Tour. He's got Contador in his way more often than not, and Contador is an amazing story in its own right because he's been. I think I'm right in saying he's been not eligible to ride now four Tours de France. I think I think that's right. You know, one way or the other with Astana and Bands. You know, I mean, it's just extraordinary. And he should be. We should be talking about Contador had things panned out differently in the same tones that we've talked about Merckx and Armstrong and, and Eno. Greatest stage racer of his generation, yeah. but it's, that ain't going to happen now. His two year ban is, is, is almost over. 100, what, 99 days till his ban is up? <laughs> yeah, just in time for the tour of Britain. <laughs> We're going to see him lining up in Guildford. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, I've, what do you mean? Yeah. Mm. Mm. Plenty doesn't look good uh, about his cleanliness, and, and, and you know the bottom line. None of us, none of us know, do we? But the, the, the only fact, inalienable fact, in all that is that he had clenbuterol in his system, and you know it's the only fact you can return to, really. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know very little about bikes, and these guys know an awful lot more. But actually, I mean, I can't, well, I guess they do. You've ridden a bike, so you must know. But um, um, at first, I thought it was absolutely hilarious, and I couldn't believe that it was. But, um, but by all accounts, it's a, it is a kind of a, a, a real possibility, isn't it? Technically, that you could. I think dismissed it as a real possibility, but somebody recently said something to me that suggested that it might be a real possibility. Yeah. Um, I remember conversations we had in the car at the Tour de France about what would be the next step. Would it be retro. geographical doping, as in... The retro know, doping. Retro doping. Yeah, retro doping. Kind of, do you, you know, in the, the first Tour de France, people used to catch the train and they used to, you know... Tacks, tacks on the road. Across the course. Tacks on the road. That's what Andy, Andy Schleck caught full of tacks. Uh, yeah, that'd be fun to return to those days, wouldn't it? But the guy who, the, who made the first YouTube video and compiled all that evidence. He actually went on to write a book about that. Um, in Italy, yeah, it's come out. Um, a, quite a thick tome, all about mechanical doping. <laughs>
But it was quite convincing when you watched the, the picture. Well, sorry. What? Yeah. I mean, it kind of did look. It kind of did look like that, and you know, it spoke would. that came out the rear end of the bike. <laughs> that, that I find really suspicious. Um, uh, yeah, but you could, you know, I mean, he did something that wasn't any more extraordinary than Tom Boonen did this yeah. year. You know, I mean, Cancellara went away with, um, I think, 40 k to go, or just under 40 k to go, and, and Boonen went away with just over 50, and and rode as if he had a motor. Um, but I didn't hear the mechanical doping rumours then. It's on a, it's on a, on a specialised bike. That's good panache. Same bike as well, wasn't it? A specialised bike. Yeah. It's quite funny. The Belgian, so there's a whole kind of microculture of Belgians in like the press room and, and cycling in general. And um, they have their own language. Well, it's not a language because they don't speak. It's just kind of winks and nudges. <laughs> but they're, and the standard, their standard sign language for someone basically doing what Cancellara or Boonen did is like, like that. They actually do it to the riders in the morning, don't they? Yeah. They walk around the buses. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was on the same question the other day in a similar event, and I this was the last question. I ended it on the most the, the <laughs> grimmest, um, most depressing note possible. So I'll get that out of the way, and then you guys can. <laughs> can I might agree with you there. Yeah. The optimism. No, um, a very sim similar thing happened. The boom in um, cycling in this country. We talk about it a lot. Rich and I have actually discussed whether it is actually happening or or it's something that we like to imagine is happening in our head to, you know, um, comfort us when we feel bad about our freelance careers. But um, it is, I think it is happening, um, but it also happened in Germany a few years ago, and that went from nothing to, you know, the stratosphere within two or three years when Jan Ulrich won the Tour de France. And, you know, I was writing a thing about another rider, Andreas Cloden, a few days ago, and in the introduction it was all about how cycling in Germany was just taking off. There was Cloden, and there was guys under him, Patrick Sinkovic, who a couple of years ago, um, later was banned. But it literally went from one day to the next. It went from everything to nothing. So I don't think that will happen in this what, country. What was the, the, the statistic on? I mean, because it was a very similar story in the sense they had a big German team sponsored by a big German brand. Yeah. Telecom. What, what you were telling me about the, the just the, you know, the kind of le the money they had. Oh, I mean, well, they would they would fly 130 journalists just to their training camp, German journalists at the start of the year, and the riders said they were just groveling these guys to get the riders in their paper. Now you will not find any media coverage about cycling in Germany. So, and it was a huge sponsor. It was like Sky. It was T-Mobile. So that is a, a cautionary tale. Um, I don't think that will happen, but I thought I should just put that in your, in your mind. There are very specific reasons for that collapse, though, aren't they? All, all, almost all doping related. So a lot of it will hinge on that. But yeah. I, I take your point. It's a brittle foundation, and it, it seems a bit grafted on, really, a kind of carbon fiber shell that we've built over a pretty rusty edifice. Um, and, and, and you know, you've got to let, you've got to hope that enough time elapses for these routes to really take take hold. The other thing that fueled the German collapse was the moral high ground that the uh, broadcasters took. You know, national television in Germany, ZDF and ARD said, wait, not showing the race, sod you, like that. ITV don't have a moral high ground. <laughs> we'll show it, whatever. Yeah, I guess the, the in Britain, in a sense, it began almost even before, because so Armstrong was kind of important, I think, here as well. Um, you know, certainly in the in the book, book's boom, um, Armstrong's book did so well that it really it transcended the sport and it, it, it convinced publishers and others that cycling boot, there was an audience there for cycling boots. So I think there's always been that kind of hardcore following in, in the UK. Um, it's certainly, it's kind of growing all the time. You really feel it multiplying. Um, I mean, Ned made a comment the other day saying that, you know, it, it was a bit like Andy Murray in tennis that we only really have one, one guy or two guys at the top. I don't, I don't agree with that. I think there are, there are slightly stronger foundations. There are guys coming through. There are guy, British riders on top teams now worldwide where there, there wasn't 10, 15, 20 years ago. You know, Dave Miller was the only one 10 years ago. So there is, there's that encouragement. The other thing that's helped enormously has been lottery funding with the, the track program. My worry is that after London, that's reduced and that starts to diminish a little bit. And you know, Dave Brailsford may leave the British program and, and that might and that is a very important foundation that might begin to crumble a little bit.
not on its own. I mean, it needs, you know, I think there's like, there are, there are you know, the, the pro scene in the UK at the moment is, is pretty healthy. But again, you know, we're in recession again, apparently, and, and these things are very much uh, dependent on, on corporate sponsorship. And if that disappears, then... One bit, and there's one big sponsor, and they're all gravitating towards that sponsor. You know, John Tin and Locke is an example of a British rider from outside the system. Well, you know, he's going to be riding for them next year, by all accounts. So you put all your eggs in one basket. It's a bit risky. But, I mean, having said that, you know, the, the, there certainly is a huge, huge interest in it. And, and you know... That, that's, I think that is real. I think, you know, there, you, just anecdotally, you see people um, cycling and you see, um, I think that there's the evidence is before us. We desperately, desperately need it to carry on, don't we, Rich? Carry on. <laughs> we're, we're, we're screwed if it doesn't carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you.